Hi, this is Richard Diaz with the Inglewood Times, and we're here with Anthony Belcher. He wrote a book called The American, and we're here to ask a couple questions about The American and have him explain what was his idea when he created or wrote this book, mm -hmm. and what is the message that you want the people to get out of this book okay. so that we can all run to the shelves and get a hold of this book. I've read this book personally. It's a really good book. Um, it's powerful. It goes all the way back. Um, Anthony was born in 1958? 56. 1956. Yes. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and hand the mic over to Anthony. So, Anthony, tell us about your book and, okay. and give us some of the highlights that you think are the most important things that people need to see. Okay. Um, as the book's titled The American because I actually started my schooling in England. I am an Air Force brat. I was born on at Lackland Air Force Base near Mount Rushmore. So I started school in England and I was introduced to my classroom as the American. The whole three and a half years we lived in England, that's how my family was referred to, the American, and that's how we got the title. Um, shortly after coming back to the States, um, I was really in shock because people made fun about my accent. Um, I had a British accent, so when I went up to a friend and said, Hell, mate, will you like to come over to my house and watch a little telly? Uh, we had to fight about that. <laughs> he made fun, he hit me, and then we ended up scrambling about it. But so, and then it was the difference in how I was treated. Um, I think it was either the first or second year back in the States. And I, uh, you know how they ask kids back in the day, they used to ask kids, about um, what you do over the summer and all of that. So I had brought up that I had gone to the London Zoo and a white teacher told me I was lying, Whoa. that I had not been to England. Um, so that's what the United States was like then. That was because at that time and point, the racism was so powerful that you're not supposed to really go nowhere or travel nowhere or be from somewhere else. And you know, it's funny, I've thought about that a lot and I don't know I mean, yes, racism was very powerful. However, it's the perception mm -hmm. that black people, you know, white America has long drawn this image of us of not being smart, not being this. You know, this is why all of our children, it seems to me, and we are as guilty of it as well, are directed towards sports, music, entertainment, and things like that instead of becoming doctors, lawyers, and so on, and professionals, and so on. So, and I kind of lost track, so you're going to have to keep me on track here. Okay, so we're, we're saying that racism had some play at that time, and it's going to always be a part of our society. But in this book, it touches on uh, the human cord uh, that you felt going into school, transitioning from one country to another, and them perceiving what you should be or, or how you should reflect who you are as a black man for yeah and or for, as a human for an eight-year-old kid it's really really confusing right you know um for an eight-year-old kid now i of course and and i spent all my time in libraries reading about america and how great it was and all of that so here i come back filled with all this patriotism with my eight-year-old self. I'm the American, the whole country has been calling me the American for the last three years. Right? And all of a sudden I find out I'm less than. Or I find out they perceive me as less than. Right. All right. And those are people in that particular demographic because uh, the clarification was uh, back in those days, uh, Martin Luther King times and stuff like that, uh, white people did march along with black people when the dogs was sick on people. And yes, yes. And they, this was before King's dying, though. Mm -hmm. This was, we got back to the States probably in 62, maybe early 63. Mm -hmm. We were living in Nebraska uh, during the March on Washington. So, again, all of that stuff was playing out. Right. But again, as a, as a little kid, you're kind of oblivious to it all mm -hmm. until it hits you in the face. Right. And, uh, the first time, and this is later, I'm, I'm skipping later on down, but even as far as by the time I was in eighth grade, I think seventh or eighth grade was the first time someone told me to go back to where I came from. Well, I was like, oh, shit, I came from South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm an American. 
So that kind of thing. So, and, and it, what it did for me because in my dynamic, in my personal household, mm -hmm. you know, I was the outside son of an alcoholic. Right. Who didn't know I wasn't his son until either after they were married. Right. Uh, so, and his alcoholism had, had uh, gotten to the place to where he was about to become a, what we call a gutter bump. Somebody who slept in the gutter because he was drunk. Right. Um, so I had that going on, and then the whole thing with with me finding out that my country didn't think I was as good as the uh, heroes I had read about, the Washingtons, the Lincolns, the Chris. I didn't read about Christmas Addict. I learned about him later. Right. But you you know, so you read about this stuff and you think, well, good, I'm an American, I can do this. Right. And when I found out that I wasn't gonna be able to do that. It, I, I spent most of my life angry. I was just pissed off. Pissed off at everybody for everything. Um, I had a, a favorite saying that I am mad at God, the world, and everybody. In it. And and that was the, how I entered young adulthood. I joined the service. And it, it plagued me. It, right. it, it, it caused me problems. And the service treated you uh, when I was in the Air Force, it, now you're talking 1974, mm -hmm. you're talking, we may be in the second year of the all-volunteer Air Force. Right. I, I can't say I was treated with any racial stuff in the military, because I was the biggest butthole in the military. I was this angry little kid who was reckless, uh, and I was smoking marijuana all the time, too. So. Right. I can't fairly accuse what happened to me in the military had nothing to do with race. Then again, you look back and then all of a sudden, you know, because my discharge, I didn't complete my four years. Mm -hmm. I was actually discharged two years early for, and they gave me an honorable discharge and all that. They just fired me for being late to work. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't think you could do in the military. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, rules change all over the place. So right. your, your emphasis in the book the thing that you wanted people to know the most when you wrote the book was? is one, the things we adults do, whether it be the alcoholism in the home or a huge nation, affects that little boy on the front of the screen mm -hmm. and all the little kids like him. So the overall message is that, you know, the obstacles we as a society put in front of our children to overcome. And then the other message is that we can't overcome. Right. We can survive. We can, as my aunt so proudly told me, go from the crack house to the white house. Right. So that's my overall message. Whatever your life, tell my, I ended up spending 25 years as a program manager working with homeless and, and addicted people, mostly with veterans. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell my clients all the time, you have no idea what your life can be like in a year if you decide to stay so and take advantage of it. Do you think that that fight in here, you said that, uh, that it was hard and, and, and going through school up to the point of being in the military, that your everyday struggle, you did overcome. What I achieve. overcame was my hatred of self. Right. And, and with my dad and mom fighting over the top of my head because I wasn't his son, uh, with the stuff I perceived uh, reading about what other opportunities people would have in this country and the country literally telling me on TV through the Martin Luther King stuff. Uh, I remember the busing stuff. At bus. It I will never ever forget the absolute vitriol and hatred I saw coming out of parents of people who lived in Boston because they were uh, integrating the schools. They so were, they were upset because of the integration. Yeah, no, they yeah, they, it was worse than anything. They gave bull. They didn't use dogs, but with their language, mm -hmm. oh, they were just as vicious as bull cops in Alabama. What was your what was your your emphasis on when, when how I, to move around that, how to work around it? Well, because uh, you have to. Actually, no, I didn't. <laughs> it you know it's kind of like none of that stuff really stops you from moving on. Right. I grew up in a small town, mm -hmm. you know, where I could get jobs and all of that. Um, so, you know, even with my bad attitude, it was the early 70s, jobs were plentiful. 
I would literally get fired today and go out Monday and get me a job. <laughs> so, uh, the saying I was looking when I got this one actually made some sense then, because there was plenty of work and it was good. It was a good paying job. This was the early '70s, were when all of the civil rights stuff from the '60s, the laws started to kick in. The big factories in my hometown, which only hired very few black people, started to hire black people uh, in accordance with our representation in the city. Mm -hmm. So, job and plenty. Uh, I think it's an old Temptation song that says, um, um, there's plenty of work and the bosses are paying. <laughs> I remember that. I'm going to read a quick excerpt from your book. And it says, uh, let me go here. Okay, so you said, uh, you said the program was founded by two Viet Vietnam combat veterans and a social worker from Santa Monica. Legend has it that John Keveney, Keveney. Keveney uh, Larry Williams, and Tony, Tony Rhinus, Rhinus, Tony Rhinus broke, in, uh, broke into then abandoned building uh, designated VA 116. Um, at the time, it was flooded, filled with rats, and had electrical wires hanging from the ceiling. They enlisted the help of Congresswoman Maxine Waters, yes. got themselves a grant or two, and created New Directions, Inc., a year-long full-service program complete with its own dining facility, barbershop, employment center, and exercise gym. Expand on that. New Directions is funny. I had, by this time, we're talking 2003, when I actually went into New Directions. I had did four or five prison terms in three different states, all behind my drug abuse. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had gotten out in March of that year. And when I entered, I actually ended up at Claire Foundation in Santa Monica mm -hmm. to detox. And when I was looking for a program, they offered me three choices. They said, you're a veteran, so we're going to send you to the VA. And I'm like, okay. And they said, you can go to a short, hard program or a long, hard program or a short, easy program. Mm -hmm. And I chose the long, hard term, the long term program, because I at that time could see I, what else was I going to do? Mm -hmm. I could get clean in 60 days, but then what? You know, I hadn't had a, a viable job by that time in maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew that I needed the extensive, hardcore treatment because I, like I said, I had been living in the streets in Boston for the last 10 years. Right. So um, that's how I ended up in New Directions. And uh, it was the hardest thing I ever did. I walked around that place for a year crying, secretly crying as my, because what they did. Now, we're talking about the time back when attack therapy mm -hmm. was popular. Right. So Describe it attack therapy. Attack therapy is you sit in like a chair like this mm -hmm. in a circle of your peers, and they tell you what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And you have to sit there and take it. Right. So I was able to sit there and take it, you know, sort out the BS and keep what was pertinent for me to make changes in my life. And what I had, what I came to, the big thing that happened to me is when I was able to reunite with one of my daughters, uh, one who I had slapped and hadn't, we hadn't spoken in 10 years. Right. So what I realized at that moment, and, and it's hard for me because I don't want to start crying. When that child tried to contact me, I felt like if that child could see something good in me after the lousy father I had been, mm -hmm. then I needed to start looking for that good too. And that's a powerful thing. A lot yeah. of people, a lot of people are facing these things nowadays, yeah. and this book kind of highlights the yeah. depth of that. Yeah, you, you know, and, and without sounding like the get off my yard, old man, which I am, and I don't have no problem with that. <laughs> you, don't be, you don't get old being no fool, remember that. <laughs> so, but, you, you know, you, you have to be able to look at yourself. Mm -hmm. Any change, any, any um, prop, uh, success you're gonna have in life, you, I think I would recommend self-evaluation as a major tool. So now, whatever situation I go in, I always, when I come out of it, if it, if it doesn't go like I planned, then I look at me instead of pointing fingers. 
what would be your best advice to the youth that are facing those type of challenges today? Because when you see this book, a lot of people have been through, I read the whole book, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things that a lot of people have been through. Right. I, I know different family members right. that have different types of addiction and, and different types of uh, history. Yeah. And, and the book touched on everything from then to now. Yeah. And uh, my, if, if you're addicted to drugs, this is my advice. If you have a drug problem, okay, first of all, admit you got a drug problem. You know, I, I used to do this with my client. If you're going through this on rent day, mm -hmm. should I pay my rent or should I get high? <laughs> then you got a drug problem. Right. All right. If you start trying to figure out how you can cheat your rent for the month <laughs> so you can have some more money to get high, mm -hmm. you've got a drug problem. Right. And you need to own that because until you own it, you can't fix it. Right. And, and that's really for uh, the fentanyl, all, and I understand it's hard to do especially drugs like heroin, fentanyl, which have alcohol, which have a physical withdrawal deal. Mm -hmm. um, crack, you get messes with your head, but heroin, heroin and fentanyl, withdrawal can kill you. Mm -hmm. Same with alcohol, withdrawal. So the, they, if the individual doesn't have it, their body withdraws so bad that it can... Right, which is why heroin addicts are out stealing, which is which where the crime comes from. Mm -hmm. Because for those types of drugs, you have physical withdrawal symptoms. And again, it depends on the individual. You may have physical. Uh, nowadays, they say kids are uh, overdosing on weed. I, I mean, Pain. Really? All kind of stuff. <laughs> really? So, but yeah, if, if you know, get help. Mm -hmm. get, not get help. Don't do it for your family. Don't do it for your wife. Don't do it for your kids. Don't do it for your parents. Do it because your life is worth living. Right. And the other thing I used to tell my clients, and I'm going to tell this to everybody out there, you deserve the best life that you can give yourself. Right. But we have to remember we have to give it to ourselves. And if I may, I've watched your family for the last 10 years. You're the hardest working dude I know. <laughs> you, you give a whole meaning to the old Wayne's comedy <laughs> that you make is hey, mine. <laughs> Them got two, three, four, five jobs. <laughs> so, but not only that, what else I would like to see is you are what's common in black America. Right. So you are not the exception. You are the rule. But when I read the book, it, 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 it showed me, uh, you know, when someone says I had this ailment or I had these issues and I had these problems, I see you have a beautiful family. Yes. And I've seen you've done great with your daughters. I've seen one as a school teacher. I've seen, yes. I mean, the grandkids are all beautiful. And so the impact that I see in the book, the great that I see in the book is that you bring out the truth and, and there's, no, there's no hiding it. And you show that you could turn it around 100% and I commend you for yes, that. Yes. And I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank so you. So how do people contact this book? Is it online? You can find the book at Waterton Books, W-A-T-E-R-T-O-N books.com. Okay. And I think right now they're selling for about 17, 18 bucks a copy. Okay. And then uh, is available online? Do you yes. have a website? Yes, that's the website I just gave you. Okay. And then uh, the other question that I had was, let me go right back here real quick. Go right into this real quick. It says, I would remind all elected officials, state, city, county, or otherwise, that their job is to serve all American people, no matter what they look like or what they believe in. It says, when our political leaders openly flame the mirror divisions of our society, rather than work together to provide fair compromise to resolve these issues, then they can only lead us to disaster. Yeah. Today, our political landscape and divisions in, in our society make me think that this must have been what it's like in the years and months and led to the Civil War. If the Republican Party, with all of its talk about conservative values, uh, actually practice this in principle, they would find themselves as multiracial political party in America. Many black and brown people vote for the Democrats, not so much because of their politics, but for their inclusiveness because the Democrats appear to be offering a seat at the table uh, of power to all Americans. And I'm in no way saying that the Democratic Party does not have its own issues with how it has traditionally and continues to treat Americans of color. However, they seem to be political party of all Americans. 
if this nation, first and only of its kind in its history of the world, is to survive, it will not be as in the past with white people being the main beneficiaries of the American dream. And I thought that was really powerful and I didn't want to yeah. not say that in this interview. Um, I, you know, when you look at the news, man, over the last, it, first of all, I, have, I wrote a poem when Obama was elected. It's on my wall. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like America, the, we, we, we had all this tremendous hope. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, you know, America stood up before the world. And at that time, as they inaugurated Barack Hussein Obama, you thought change was coming. America, no, America had proven to the world that change came. That what we say, we mean. Right. But now, a black president after America. after four years of Trump, after when you read you read the stuff in the new, it's insane. Mm -hmm. uh, the, with all of that, I, I'm not sure America isn't headed for some sort of civil armed conflict amongst the citizens. I, it's scary. Right. You know, it's scary. I think the conversation that's had here can deflect that from happening. I think it's, it's a conversation, like we talk about our media outlets and we talk right. about these books. Uh, with the Inglewood Times, we ask questions to elected officials on both sides. We ask authors of books how they feel because we want what you share with the community for us to give us an awareness and we want that voice to be, what can you do for the people? Exactly. You know, not this one pitted against that one or that one pitted against this one. And I didn't see that in other newspapers or magazines right. or, or media companies. And I didn't see it in books as clean as how you had it here. And I, I recommend this book. Thank you. Thank you very much. I recommend much. this book. It's a really good book. And here on the back, got a little picture of him here. <laughs> All right. So it's the, the American by Anthony Belcher. At WaterdenBooks.com. At WaterdenBooks.com. So I really want to thank you for the time that you spent thank with us on man. this interview. And the book is going to do great. Because I appreciate it's powerful. It. I read it. I appreciate Every it. Every word of it. Give thank him a link to read it. He told me only he read part of it. <laughs>